Welcome to Practical Talk Time. I'm your host, Usha Kumar. Last show, I had with me a wonderful romance novelist discussing her books and how she writes. And she's here again, Katie Regnery. She's here again to talk about her romance novels and how she goes about writing it. And I'm going to pick her brain on everything <laughs> else, you know, the actual process of writing and getting it published. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to be back. <laughs> uh, last time we discussed quite a bit mm -hmm. about your process. Yes. But um, I do want to ask you a lot more. You, you, know, you live in the Danbury, greater Danbury area. I do. I live in and, Ridgefield. And you live with your family, mm -hmm. with your children. My husband and two children, yes. And uh, you... Was a, you were a stay-at-home mom yes. for many years? I was for eight years. Huh. And then something inspired <clears throat> you to become a writer. So yes. what, what was that? Well, you know, my children were um, growing up. I mean, my, my daughter's six. But um, they were going to elementary school. And I knew that um, I was going to have a lot more time on my hands. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't been in the workforce formally for eight years. Um, and I was an office manager before, which is really not a very creative field to be in. And I felt like I wanted to do something more creative. I just okay. didn't know what that was. I ran into a friend um, at a nail salon. Uh, her name is Randy Davis, by the way. She's a wonderful painter in um, Ridgefield. And she said, you got, you got to get out. You got, you've got to volunteer work. You have to do something. You're going to get depressed. So figure out something. Go take a real estate course. And I thought, I don't want to sell I mean, houses I don't want to or sell rent houses. houses. Yeah. I have no interest in that. So um, she said, well, look into Ridgefield Continuing Ed and see what they offer. And um, they had a short story class. And people had always been very kind to me about my thank you notes and my emails. Really, that was the extent oh, okay. of my writing. And I thought, you know, just see what it's all about. And I, I really lucked out. There was a wonderful teacher there. Um, and I learned so much from him over the ensuing six months. And so was that a six month course or what was it, it was several two, three, small courses? Two three month courses. Okay. And um, each week there would be a different lesson. Um, one was about point of view. Um, another was um, just about how to do an all dialogue scene. Um, another one was doing a poem um, based on an, another writer's um, style and just sort of parroting that mm -hmm. style. Um, so each week we would come back with our work done. And, and any narratives? Like, like just an exposition, like yeah. an essay. Yeah, yeah, there was some. That, that's a, I mean, when you write romance novels, that's a tough balance sometimes, your exposition versus your dialogue yeah. scenes. There are a lot of readers who really want to get to the next dialogue scene. Um, so you have to be able to make your exposition, your, you know, your long paragraphs of, of either yeah. what's going on in their head or what's happening around them. You have to make them kind of punchy and quick to get to the next scene where they're where you have interacting. The exchange, yeah. Yes. Words. So, um, but after that class, I wrote my first novel by proxy um, in the fall of 2012. Um, and, um, and what is that? Oh, by proxy. What does it talk about? Oh, it's, uh, it's cute. It's a, it's a story of, um, I, I wanted to write a short story. I didn't set out to write a novel. I was, okay. I was angry about the novel writing community because I'd been rejected by every agent in the country, oh, I see. Um, which was painful. And I'd sort of given up. Um, but then there was this contest that came to me via email, and it said, write a short story for 4,000 words or less. Oh. And I thought, OK, 4,000 words. I think I'll write a romance story because I've always loved romance. And, um, but for 4,000 words, which is, that's a very tight story, um, I need something interesting, a hook. I started looking on Wikipedia. I, I started with arranged marriage, you know, maybe some funky law yeah. about arranged marriage. And that led me to proxy marriage, which led me to double proxy marriage, which is a, a really obscure legal loophole. Um, this is real. This isn't fiction. This exists in the state of Montana. And it provides that two people who cannot be in Montana at the same time to take their wedding vows. And I should, yeah. I should give this caveat. It's mostly used by servicemen and women. They can designate people to stand in for them. Um, it can't just be done with signatures. You have to have a human being stand there and take your vows for you. And in my story, um, by proxy, um, what happens is this woman who um, uh, works at an army hospital in Germany and her boyfriend who's stationed in Afghanistan, they have one weekend of passion in London, um, she ends up pregnant and they're just 
frantic. They come from these conservative, um, you know, um, Lutheran families, and uh, and they know they have to get married. But again, she's in Germany and yeah. he's in Afghanistan. And is it only allowed where for some? very serious reason they cannot um, make it to be in frank person? with you um, I'm not sure that you have to have a really serious reason I know that the it's mostly used by mm -hmm. servicemen okay. and women um, there there may be something where where they encourage you to show up in person I mean you really should show up in yeah. person if you can but, I would think but yeah. I've known I I once attended an Islamic Muslim wedding okay. in India and um, the bride was there and everything, and the groom was not there. Okay. And I said, where is the groom? How are you getting married? He's and I said, no, no, he, he's in the bar. U.S. and he's going to just do it from there. He's going to just. Was, <laughs> it, was it an arranged marriage? Well, it, it, I don't know. I don't think it was an arranged marriage. It but wasn't. It wasn't, but she was just there. And, and he was somewhere he else. He was somewhere else, and they got married, and everybody's having a party, and everything and is going on. He's and he's uh, having a little group with him you know <laughs> and in those days we didn't even have a video yeah. facilities not so romantic this, this i'm talking about like 30 years ago you know and so uh, just over phone yeah you know. i mean the reason i asked if that was arranged is because i wonder if that was a way to get her over to america it was if she could only get a green card after uh, there was I, a formal no, i think that guy marriage. just came back to india to live because these are children from very well-established families okay. there. Okay. And for them, it's too much hardship to live in the U.S. Oh, wow. <laughs> they, wow. they have more luxury <laughs> in India. Okay. Interesting. So, so he was here for studies or whatever it was, okay. training or something. And they got married But they proxy. got married, and for me, it was a big shock, and that was the first yes. time I came across something like this. Yeah. But to know that there's something, there's oh, yeah. a law right here yeah. in Montana. Yeah, and, and you know, it is, it is used um, frequently, frequently enough that there are lawyers in Montana who actually have um, proxies um, who they pay $50 each to show up and take the vows. <laughs> um, in my story, um, the bride and groom want something more personal. <laughs> so they, the bride asks her best friend and the groom asks his cousin uh -huh. and they show up to take the vows. Um, they miss their appointment and so Jenny Lindstrom, who is the girl who's shown up to take vows, and Sam Kelly, who's the cousin who's shown up, um, are forced to spend a weekend together oh. because they can't get another appointment they, until Monday I morning. I see, I see. Yeah. So and that's they, what that story was. Okay. Yes, and they have to spend the weekend together, and they don't want to like each other, and she's from the country, and he's from the city, so mm -hmm. there's that built-in conflict, and by, they're so irresistible to each other. So. so Going back a little bit, sure. you know what happened to that four thousand word story? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so I you wrote I was going for that? to write. I was going to use this whole double proxy marriage hook and have a, just oh, a short I see story. For that. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I was just you know these two people show up at a courthouse to take the vows. It doesn't happen. And then I thought, gosh, I can do better than that. And I kept writing and I wrote more and I wrote more. And these characters came alive for me. And then suddenly Jenny had these three older Swedish hot <laughs> brothers and. And Sam had this whole backstory where he had been dating a supermodel and she was so shallow and awful. And, and um, you know, it, was, it became really interesting to, to work with them and be with them and spend time with them. And the book just flowed so fast. It took me two months um, to write the whole thing. And um, then I had a beta group read it. I had so you didn't submit it? Or you did? Not initially. Okay. Um, initi I, I was still a little burned okay. from all of those All agents. the rejections. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, um, I, I had some friends and family read it, and then I edited it, and then, um, then I did. I, I decided, well, I, didn't, I decided not to send it back to agents because I, I mm. felt a little sad about how that had gone down. So I sent it to small publishers, and I got four offers for it. So that was where I sort of had a, it felt like a game changer at that point. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's a nice, fresh perspective, and it's very different. It's, the styles know, that the smaller uh, it is. folks you know, it is. select. The small publishers are very different. I mean, you're not, you know, big New York publishers, you're one of thousands and thousands. You know, I'm, I'm one of about 60 authors. Um, you know, I text the editor-in-chief, Chris Kieslar, um, all the time. My editor, Jill, and I, you know, we text back and forth, and we talk on email. And um, there's a real shorthand. It's very personal. Um, 
you know, as opposed to feeling like you're one of uh, in a cog yeah. system, you know, you you really do feel like they they're investing, you know, some time because and somebody into has you. to actually read it to accept Absolutely. it, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I I'm grateful for that too because, you know, after so much rejection, you know, for somebody mm -hmm. to to email you and say we love your book, we want to buy it. I mean, oh my gosh, I was running around the house like crying and screaming, <laughs> and I'm gonna write a book. You know, it's so exciting. So. You have only been writing for a couple of years now. Yeah, two years. Yeah. And well, already really, you have yeah. how many books published? Uh, I have five. I have five, five out books. right now. Um, four um, full-length novels and one novella. And I have two more under contract with Burroughs. Um, these two are also Montana books, and they'll okay. be out in the next um, six months. So by the end of 2014, I should have seven books available. You've been writing <laughs> so quickly. How much time do you spend writing, and then how do you get the time to have it published? Right, okay. Um, okay, my children are in school for eight hours a day, and I work on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. I work from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and of that, um, in that eight hours, I would say that um, probably three to four hours is spent actually writing. Oh, and the other three I to see. four is spent um, on social media and marketing myself and um, talking to my readers, um, you know, and, and getting my books out for review. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you spend so much time on social media, that's got to be so much work. It's, it's such a yeah. drag. I, for me personally, I love it. You I, enjoy the process. I'll tell you what, it's like going to a big party every day. I have this big party with all of these fantastic personalities, these bloggers and other writers, and we talk and we laugh, and they mm -hmm. make these fantastic double entendres. And I mean, I... I don't know why anybody would think that doing the social media promotion was work because I think it's, seriously, I've had the best time. It's like a two-year party. It's just been so much fun. And um, so, yeah, I, I admit, too, that some of it's not work. Some of it's just I'm just having a good time. So I'll go back and forth Which is with great. I mean, um, I think the best thing to do is find something that you enjoy yes. doing, which yes. you have done. Yeah. And then you're also enjoying the process of writing. It's yes. not like, oh, my God, I, I already collected some money advance, oh, yeah. and now I have to write this, no, no. and I have a deadline. You don't have that kind you of You know, uh, I don't so. feel that way at all. And I, I love my Montana book so much, and I love the characters so much that, I mean, I have two books under contract right now, and, and one of them is completely written, and one of them is, uh, I'd say it's 80% finished. And I'm actually starting to feel a little bit, you know, almost nervous, like, should I write one more novella? I mean, the, you know, and as, as my audience grows, I just had um, my book, the one I was telling you about, the by proxy story, just went to the top of the Amazon bestseller list on um, this past weekend. And so my audience is growing. That was a, thousands of people who bought that book. And as more people read about my Lindstrom's in Montana and, and they come to me and they say, I loved your story. I was wondering if you could do a story about this character, this mm. small character. It does make me consider if I want to write more. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what is your educational background? Did oh, you sure. study literature, journalism, or no. writing? No, I, I, went to, um, I went to Kenyon College, which is in Ohio. It's a um, great liberal arts college in Ohio. It's actually fairly well known in the States for um, its English course, okay. um, which it breaks my mother's heart that I did not yeah. take one English class while I was there. I, I don't know. I, it's not like I wasn't interested. I, I, I've, I always kind of liked writing, I guess, but my interest at the time really was in international studies. I wanted to live abroad in South America. I did end up living abroad in Bolivia for a while um, and studying there. And, uh, and religion was my other real passion. And so I, I studied international studies and religion, and I never took one English course. It's so, so sad. And then you took this writing course here. It's yeah. like six just months, away, one, just six month two month hour one. a week writing course. But I course. think it was worth it because you did it when you were really interested in I, doing yes, something. And I was ready. And let me tell you, anyone who wants to be an author, you have to have such a, a thick skin. Because really, you take a piece of yourself, of your soul, of your heart, and you put it on a page. And it's like a, sometimes yeah. it feels like a dartboard, and people are throwing darts. I hate your story, you know, and they're so mean, and you just want to cry your eyes out. And if you can't take it, um, you know, you just, you won't last. There's no way. You, it's every single day somebody's going to tell you something mean about what you write. And you because have to be able I to think, take depending it. on your own mood, you know, when you write a bunch of 10 pages or 40 pages, right. as you mentioned, you write. 
sometimes that entire 40 page, depending on your mood, would be a little quiet. And, well, and the readers might even find it dull. Right. And then another day you write something, you're, right. you're very active. Uh, you know what, actually, to be frank with you, though, if, if I'm in a bad mood, I don't write. Um, I, I, I have to keep my mood level for the story. What I find really helps, though, is that I make a soundtrack of music um, with every book. And oh. then when I start writing, I turn that soundtrack on. And the music really affects my mood, and it brings me to whatever place I'm in for that book. So every book I write has a separate soundtrack of about 10 songs. And those songs, um, they, they take over my whole mood, and they so keep me in a static place. For your book, Playing for Love? Playing for Love at Deep yeah, Haven. Deep Haven. Yeah. What kind of uh, soundtrack did you have for that? That's an interesting book because there's so much music in that book that's mm -hmm. fictional that I yeah, made exactly, up. Yeah, exactly, because there's also music in the story, yes. the Metallica music. Right, yeah. right, right. There is, um, there's, in that story, um, there's fictional music that I wrote for the book, and there's yeah. also real music um, in that book. There's yeah, Morning, like the Claire de Lune. The Claire de Lune yeah. is, is in there, and Morning Has Broken, which mm -hmm. is an old Cat Stevens yeah. song. Um, you know, I'm a big, huge fan of music from the 50s, 60s, and mm -hmm. 70s, and it figures really prominently. Also I in Midsummer see. Sweetheart, um, yeah. a lot of that music figured in. And also in See Jane Fall, almost all of my, mu my books have a lot of music. And So you do write a little bit about what you know. <laughs> I guess so. I guess I do write about what I know. I, I, but I don't know if I know music or if I just love it. I think yeah, I just really Whatever you, you love heard it. and you're familiar yeah. with, you're just putting it Something in there. Something that resonates mm. with you and pulls that emotion out yeah. of you and then I think readers connect with that emotion readers want the deep stuff I mean they want whatever whatever feels deep and visceral to me as an author that's what they want they know when you're not giving it up to and that's what a writer should put in writing. I think so what I think they so. feel very deeply yeah and what they yeah connect with very deeply I think that's the only way to really capture somebody else's attention I'll read a book about anything mm -hmm. as long as as long as the author's really passionate about what they're writing about. I mean, I don't care what they're writing about. If they're passionate, then they'll hook me. And so for me, what I'm really passionate about, I guess, is people finding true love. Yeah. And what kind of book do you write? I mean, do read? you read? Sorry. I almost exclusively read romance, and pretty I much see. always have. And I'm going to be really unapologetic about that, because I feel like a lot of people <laughs> apologize for, oh, I should read some nonfiction. I should read about Lincoln. <laughs> well, I, you know what? I, I admire historical figures, that, but I love yeah. romance. I want the entertainment value of it. I want the happily ever after. I want to smile. I want to cry. I want the love story. I think um, your books carry the romance really well. Thank you. And with all Thank the you. conflicts, whatever else yeah. you put in. Hopefully. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, but then how do you come up with these characters? Because in each book, it's a different character. It is. It is. I try to make my characters very relatable, first of all, like um, somebody who could be your next door neighbor. I don't, I don't like the whole, you know, billionaires. Um, actresses I mean I, I might have some elements in them um, you know like in Deep Haven it was yeah. somebody who wrote music and a novelist but I really try for these people to be very regular people and to have the sorts of um, emotional challenges that we really all have our Every one of us has a set of insecurities and fears and things that make us sad and happy and joyful and that turn us on. Um, and I just, I think that my readers will better relate to a book if I create a very um, real character. Very. And then how do you, you, do you imagine the character? Like what they look With, like? In terms of appearance, in terms of their right. uh, nature, temperament, right. everything. Um, Gosh, I wish I had a better process for you. I do. I wish that I could say that I build characters. You know, there are a lot of authors who build their characters. They have a sheet of paper and it says eye color, yeah. you know, hair color. And you do mention all eye, eye colors and I hair do. colors. But you know, I, it's not really a process. I got to tell you, these people just pop into my head and I find myself talking to them. I know it sounds crazy, right? It's not. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but they do. I suddenly I feel like I know them, and I. So and you, I, you kind of visualize visualize the whole thing in three D. I do. I do. Okay. It's like a yeah, movie. Right. I've and said that before, and then it was um, it was really interesting for me to learn that other authors don't write like that because I, I shared one time with um, a table full of authors. Don't you love it when you're really on a roll and you're watching the movie in your head, and they yeah. were all like, what? What are you talking about? None of them knew what I was talking oh, I about. See. But for me, when I'm writing a story, 
I really am watching the story unfold. I'm watching them do these things. And then it's almost like when you're writing it, you have a pause button. So let's say they're about to go in for a kiss. And I'm like, wait a second, they shouldn't kiss yet. Pause. And then I <laughs> do the delete button. And, um, and then I, I keep writing. And now they're going to hug instead. Okay. You know, or, And it's, it's having this control over these people. I mean, I'm probably a really power-hungry person or something. Because having this control That's over true. what happens next is, I love it. I love it. As a child, did your mother read to you a lot? Oh, my mother. She's so wonderful. My mother lives in Darien, so she's local as well. Um, she, she did read to me. More than that, my mother absolutely loved all of the, um, the BBC versions of the Jane Austen mm. um, stories and the, the Bronte sisters. So, I mean, it was a huge, like, cinema, like, uh, what am I trying to say, movie education, like, um, of Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre and Persuasion, Sense and Sensibility, yeah. Emma, and I mean these were the I had to of, read most of them and for school reading. I did too, eventually, but my days. mother read Pride and Prejudice to me when I was probably eight or nine years old. Um, and, then, and then we watched the movie together and I mean it's really magical to sit with your mother and watch these movies and yeah. see how much she loves them and she's introducing them to me and I mean this is a lifelong love affair with love okay. stories for me I mean it and she fostered it it's all her fault <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I, I'm just trying to figure out because right now I'm kind of in a writing group okay uh, trying yeah. to encourage Good. each other to yeah. write but nowhere near fiction I was trying okay. to I was only going to write at least my own experiences in life, okay. or the little stories right. that came along, sure. just for like my own family, almost yeah. just for my own family, and nothing more uh, <laughs> serious than that. But I find all these other writers, and we sit and talk, right. and I'm sure that this kind of information and knowledge will be very useful for them, oh, because then they yeah. can also start developing this process of imagining the whole scene right. unfold, right. and not trying to just look at the two-dimensional paper. Right, I mean, gosh, like, don't look at the two-dimensional paper yeah. at all. If anything, stop looking at the two-dimensional paper yeah. and remember how you felt. Like, like whatever yeah. it is that you're writing about in your yeah. life, you said you have little stories. Yeah. Like, don't even think about the keyboard or, or the paper yeah. and pen or however you're doing that. I would suggest that you, if music helps you, great. If smell helps you, great. I find the senses can be really evocative. Nice. but. Get your your head to that place where you remember how you felt, how you felt yeah. when that happened to you at 11 years old yeah. or 16 or 20, because that's what a reader really wants to know. All of the rest of it, the descriptions, and they'll they'll make it richer. Yeah. But what they really want to know is the how the emotions, the feelings how, that have to come out yes. in the words. Yes. And I'm sure, I hope people are watching this I and do too, <laughs> really yes. taking notes because <laughs> it's going to really help their own oh, writing. Good. And, and now we have to wonder, you know, how they're going to develop the tenacity and also the thick skin. Right. Well, you know, you have to have a lot of faith in yourself too and say, you know, maybe my writing's not for everyone, but I mean, I've had wonderful emails from people who have said things like, I had turned my back on, on romance and now I'm reading it again because I like your books. Mm -hmm. or, and it's such a compliment that, uh, that my words could touch someone and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that my words could resonate with them. It, it's, it's really amazing that feeling that, that you have something to share and I think any writer has something to share. You know, no matter where you are, are in your journey, you have to just tap into it. And that's the mm -hmm. most, that's probably the most painful and, and um, risky thing about being an author is that you have to tap into those really, really um, visceral, deep, sometimes painful, sometimes yeah. joyful emotions. So in your romance novels, when you write a story, a story might be just very mild, uh, it might be just romance and happily ever after, but then uh, the readers want to see some action, some drama, some, mm. some big you know, something new that they can learn from. Right. So how do you, you know, incorporate those themes into this? Um, you know, first of all, I think writing romance, it's more about entertainment than, um, than instruction. So, so I mean, I, I sort of let the, the story, you know, 
build organically. That said, a story is pretty boring unless you have yeah. some conflict. Yes, exactly. Or, it's so, like anybody's life, right. basically. So, I mean, you do have to, from the get-go, you can't just have, you know, we walked into the kitchen, we made some dinner. It has to be walked into the kitchen. Oh, my God, who is this man in my kitchen? You know, and, yeah. and, then, and then who is the man? Oh, I knew him 20 years ago, and he's I back. And, <laughs> yeah, and I don't know who you are, and my husband's here. And, you know, suddenly, I mean, yeah, so too. you can take any normal thing. You can be walking down the street. You can be driving your car. I had somebody ask me once, do you always have a story in your head? Are you always thinking of the next story? And it is true. I am. And I was at a, a dinner party recently, and two friends of mine were talking about, they said, oh, remember that little bistro we went to and we had the chocolate mousse? And she sort of smiled at her husband, and I'm watching them talk about this. And I realized that there's m way more to this story. The way they're smiling at each other, there was a lot more to that Maybe, chocolate yes. mousse. <laughs> I didn't know what. But, um, but you know, so then I didn't ask because I'm not intrusive like that, but I started thinking, what? What could it be? Yeah. What was it about the chocolate mousse? Was there an engagement ring hidden in the chocolate mousse? <laughs> was, um, did the chocolate mousse like fall on her lap and they had to go buy her a new dress? Like, what, what was it about this? this normal situation. So you uh, develop it further that way, yeah. with more interest. And okay. I, and, but you can go in 50 different directions. Yeah. What is it about a couple having dessert that takes it somewhere else and tells a story? That's very interesting. You do have an act for telling a story. Oh, and thank I you. And I think that's come in handy to keep writing so quickly. Yes, I do um, too. Yeah. So you never had the writer's block. <laughs> um, you know, here's my thing with writer's block. Writer's block is so much in your head that it's what you make it. If, if you have writer's block with one story, write a different story. Nice. If you have writer's block with the story you're on, keep writing it. Maybe what you write is total crap, but sometimes by the time you get to the third page of crap, it turns into something interesting. Yeah. Suddenly it changes. Like, you can't just roll over and play dead because the ideas yeah. aren't flowing fast. Yeah. You have to keep going. Figure out how to keep going. How does a writer develop his or her own language skills in terms of expressing it? Um, do, like, so in your case, you didn't have to do anything special, but I do find in the writing group there are people you know, who need to... Right, uh, to find their voice, you mean? How, how they write? You know, what kind of, yeah, how do they develop their language to write it more effectively? All right, I guess what I would say for that is that you have to read what you want to write. And some people think that's a mistake because they think that it will interfere with their voice. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I think that you, you need to read you need to read other romances if you want to write romance. You need yeah. to read other nonfiction if you want to write nonfiction. Because it's one of the best ways to understand okay. um, how to use your own voice is to read somebody else's. Okay, we are out of time. I thought but we might thank be. Thank you very much, Katie. <laughs> that was wonderful. Yeah, thanks, And I Yusha. hope you come again. I will, with anytime. More new stories. Yes, anytime. Thank <laughs> you. It was such a pleasure <laughs> talking to you. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you have questions or comments, please write to practicaltalktime at yahoo.com. Um, until next time, goodbye. <laughs>